Every so often, a hardcore arcade style video game will come out that will not get fair treatment from video game critics like IGN or Eurogamer and will not even get a fair shake among the general gaming audience. You'll see negative Steam reviews, negative Twitter comments, negative YouTube videos. But then over time, this misunderstood game slowly generates a cult classic among gaming hipsters who recognize its bold and innovative game design decisions, especially in today's environment where games coming out are all the same and far too easy. And so seeing the reception for Contra Operation Galaga, you're probably wondering, does this game fall into this status? Is this a misunderstood masterpiece for the future? No. No, it is not. Somehow, Contra Operation Galaga has managed to miss all of its audience demographics. If both IGN and the Electric Underground both agree that your run and gun shooter sucks, but for entirely different reasons, you've got problems on your hands, son. And so let's begin with the more surface element issues of this game that even the more casual viewers have pointed out. First of all, the graphics. What happened? How does an officially sanctioned sequel by Konami to the Contra series, which has always had beautiful, amazing sprite art and also some pretty cool looking 3D stuff on the PS2, shoutouts to Contra Shattered Soldier. How does this series have a sequel in the year 2024 look like a mobile game from the 2000s? When I saw trailers for this game, I actually thought it was a mobile game. I was like, eh. That's a shame they can't bring out a real Contra game. Everything's coming out to mobile now. You got Metal Gear on pachinko machines. You got Contra on cell phones. But no, this is not a cell phone game. This is a full on PC release at 144 FPS. And it looks like hell on earth. Now, I remember my initial thoughts were, well, they probably just had like one poor dude working on this game. This was a really low budget effort made a couple bucks here and there, throw it to some outsourced developer. You know, they're trying their best, but they never really made games before. And you know, this is their first effort and Konami's desperate. And then you look at who made the game. WayForward made this game. And then you look at the credits of the game. How many people worked on this game? Look at the credits for this game. I thought it was this tiny little indie low budget release, like a Billion people worked on the game. More people worked on this game than a Marvel movie, I swear. I was shocked when the credits were rolling because I was watching for the artist. I was like, oh, who's the poor soul who did the art for this game? There's like 10 people who did the art for the game and it looks this awful. I can't fathom it. I cannot understand how this game looks so bad and how anyone allowed it to be published in this form. Like you look at the models and the textures, not only do they look unfinished, they really do look like something you would buy from the Unity store. This looks like, oh crap, yeah, we gotta put graphics in the game here. Let's go ahead and just buy stuff off Unity and throw it in there. Look at the enemy design. Look at the characters. Everyone looks so painfully generic. It looks like amateur 3D fan art made in the Warcraft 3 engine. It is insane how basic and generic the visuals of this game are. None of it feels Contra either. When you compare one to one, not even like era to era. When you compare one to one this game's graphical style to Contra Shattered Soldier on the PlayStation 2, it is insane how much better Contra Shattered Soldier on the PlayStation 2 looks than this game with the character detail, with the level design, with the background design, with the theming. Everything looks so much more consistent and coherent and polished than this game and Shattered Soldier came out again on the PlayStation 2. Not only that, some people were saying, well, they went with this art style because, you know, we want to do something different from sprite art and we get it. I do think sprite art is overdone and I can see WayForward and Konami saying, you know what, we need to move forward from just doing throwback sprite art all the time. But that doesn't give you a blank check to make the most crappy looking 3D game of all time, uh, especially with the 3D elements of this game, because basically the idea, the notion of why you would take Contra and put it in 3D for people who are just looking for the sprite art 
is because with 3D, you're able to do certain effects and camera work that, you know, it's really hard to do with sprite art. So you can rotate the stages, you can change the camera angles, you can change the dimensions of the gameplay. And when you look at something like Contra Shattered Soldier, that is exactly what Konami were doing. That was what was so cool about that era of 3D games where they were actually using the 3D for gameplay, right? Like in boss fights, it's tilting upward at different angles, lots of different movements with the camera, lots of different perspectives. It's making use of the 3D space. This game, again, 2024, it's used that the 3D space barely ever comes into play. And it's like the most minor thing that makes basically no difference. It doesn't even look cool. And then at the end, they're like, well, look at this. We can do some real cool visual tricks with the crystals to make it bend and warp. Isn't that so neat? And I hate that with the level design, but we'll talk about that later. But visually, this game never makes use of its 3D models and 3D graphics. And then you look at the 3D versions of the characters, they look so generic. They look so bland. No personality, no Riz, as the young kids would say. No charisma. Like, look at the Shattered Soldier characters. Look at these characters. <sighs> the enemies as well. The enemies look like they were dropped in from the Unity store. I cannot emphasize just on the visuals alone how much of a letdown this game is. I looked at the visuals of this game and I was like, hard pass. No way am I paying $40 for this abomination. But then I heard people talking about, well, you know, the gameplay holds up though. It's about the gameplay. So we'll get into the gameplay. We'll talk about that gameplay. But if you look at this game and you say, I'm not paying $40 for that, I think that's a fair assessment. You could leave the review at that. Games do have a duty to look good, especially at this price point, especially with a series. Again, it would be a little bit different if this was like some scrappy guy on itch.io and the, you know he's trying to get started and so he's got these like placeholder kind of ugly assets. I can empathize with that. But for a major studio with hundreds of people on staff, how this got through in the condition that it is boggles the mind. I can only imagine that what happened was some crazy boardroom creation by committee crap where they hired all these different people to work on the game and no one was agreeing on anything. Who knows? But something terrible happened with the development and art development of this game. And if you know, please go ahead and comment what happened. Someone needs to explain themselves because this is madness. This is insane. And then the music, the music, generic. This was one of those soundtracks where I'm not actually going to put the real game soundtrack in the review because one, you all don't need to be punished for that. It's not your fault this game has a bland, boring, terrible OST. But also, some of the game music is so generically orchestrated movie sounding that at times, this has happened with some game soundtracks like Red Dead Revolver. If you put that soundtrack and gameplay footage on YouTube, sometimes it will get copyright struck from movie studios who will think it's from a movie. Now, that's probably not the case here, but that's what it sounds like to me. So borderline generic, you could possibly be copyright struck for. And then you have the content of the game where instead of spending the money on graphics, visuals, music, the cores of what makes a game fun to play, instead you've got all this story, all these voice actors, script supervisors, just watch the credits. More people worked on the story of this game than I think the gameplay at this point. And you know, if this was a Final Fantasy game, if this is Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, then you want to bring in some borderline Hollywood actors and it's a big selling point of the franchise. Not that I'm really into that, but at least that makes some sense. Contra? Ah, we meet at last. You're the two warriors who've been tearing through my men. You the guy in charge of Red Falcon? I am Baralis, the vanguard bringing order and justice to this planet. Just had to post about this island vacation first, huh? And who are you, two soldiers, to stand against my unstoppable forces? We're Contra, the Earth Marine Corps' finest. Contra? Is that so? Leave this island! Contra story? Why would you put all this in a Contra game? This is clearly where my $40 are going. 
And it would be one thing if the game was just a slam dunk home run in all the other aspects of the game. Like it was nailing everything. It's got great visuals, great gameplay, great sound. Everything looks great, sounds great, plays great. And so then you want to splurge a little bit extra for that little bit of icing on the cake with great voice actors and story and all that. Sure, go ahead. But you can't skip out on the essentials of the game, the cake batter, and just give me icing and be like, 40 bucks, playa. Especially for something of this genre. And usually I don't remark upon these types of things in my reviews. I skip the cutscenes, skip the dialogue, and whoever's into that, you know, do your thing. I'm not going to worry about it. But in the case of this game, the difference, the dichotomy between the amount of effort in the gameplay and the amount of effort in the story and voice acting was just absurd to the point that I felt the need to just point it out at least. Uh, but now let's talk about the main meat of this situation, the gameplay, because if you have eyeballs, you can already visually see how ugly the game is. But one thing I do want to remark on before I talk about the gameplay is this notion I've seen across some reviews like the Nintendo Life Review, and I've heard this re repeated in other places, which is the idea that all that matters is gameplay. You know, visually for us hardcore, real, true gamers, we only really care about that sweet gameplay. Visuals, you know, that's for the casuals. I heavily disagree with this concept. I think it's perfectly valid if the game is this much of a step down compared to the rest of the series. Contra is not a new series. It's not a new franchise. There is a long legacy of games you can play from if you are a Contra fan. In fact, there's a lot of really cool Contra games like Shattered Soldier that you probably haven't played that would be worth checking out. But on the visuals alone, I think it is valid to dismiss the game. But I'm going to put the visuals aside and talk about the gameplay for the rest of the review because there are a lot of issues with this game's gameplay that I haven't seen other people commenting on. First of all, I titled this review Developer Fan Fiction because that is what it is. This often happens, especially with Western studios, when they are hired to make a sequel for a franchise that they did not originally create and they do not know the fundamentals of its design. And so what they do is they go through the games in the series and look at them from a fan's perspective, not from a developer's perspective. And they just look at various aspects of their designs and mechanics and tropes and they think, oh, that would be great. Why don't we put them all together and make like a greatest hits version game and that'll be the sequel. And we see this all the time. They go through, they take various concepts, they take various mechanics, they throw them into a blender, they add in a dash of modernization for the new generation, and boom, there you go. A brand new Contra, a Contra that the Gen Zs are gonna love. Operation Galaga. That happens in movies all the time, and it works out in games as well as it works out in movies, in my opinion. And so Operation Galaga, where do I even begin? Let's start with the basics, the nuts and bolts of this game's level design, the aspect ratio. This game, of course, is in a 16 by nine modernized aspect ratio coming from a series that is traditionally in a four by three aspect ratio. And the thing about this is depending on the genre and depending on the way the game works, changing aspect ratio for a series may or may not be that big of a deal. In an FPS, maybe seeing a little bit more of the level, you know, that might not change all that much. But it turns out in a side-scrolling shooter, the aspect ratio is incredibly important. It is a fundamental shift that needs to be handled with a lot of care. This is a very common mistake I see among shoot 'em ups and shmups all the time as they stick their games in 16 by 9 aspect ratios and don't think about, wait a second here, I've essentially doubled the size of the playfield almost. I've made the playfield way bigger than it once was. So what do you do about this? There are games that do this correctly and think about it and they shift around the way the sprites are scaled, you know, make the sprites giant and helps fill in that extra screen real estate. But in the case of something like Contra, this issue is incredibly important to pay attention to because the thing that kept the level design of the older Contras in check, the level design of the Nintendo Contras, for example, is that because the aspect ratio of the screen real estate was smaller, it meant that there was less of a gap between the player scrolling the screen and enemies appearing on the screen, which prevented you from using a technique that I call stepping. 
Stepping is a technique that each side-scrolling shooter that is manually scrolling needs to be very careful about. You'll see this in Metal Slug as well, where if you slowly advance forward, that can slowly bring enemies on screen, and then you can just snipe them before they're that active or that much of a threat. This is a very powerful fundamental technique for getting a 1cc or clear of most side-scrolling shooters. The thing about it is, in games that really think about their design, what they do is they start challenging this in different ways. So, Metal Slug, for example, has screens that will lock you in. So as soon as you step in there, it'll push you into this locked spawning arena where you can't step around things. You have to deal with things spawning into there. The later Contra games, like Shattered Soldier, really dealt with this by saying, you know what? We're gonna lock you into these screens or we're gonna put bosses in here. So deal with that. And the thing about it, this is what Contra did as a series, where in the older Nintendo games, how it dealt with the level design was it gave you shorter range weapons with more limited aiming, and then it had smaller screens and it had more aggressive spawns in the back as well. So it kept you in check and prevented you from just slowly stepping through the levels. They did not think about this at all with Contra Operation Galaga because not only is now this level like twice as long so you can see way in advance enemies that are going to appear before you, but also they brought in weapons that they shouldn't have brought in for these types of levels because the weapons that it brings in are from Contra on the SNES and Contra on the Genesis where they have the homing weapons. The homing weapons are weapons that were designed for boss fight games. The games where you fight bosses, homing weapons are a great inclusion because it's like, okay, you can always hit the enemy but the trade-off is that you don't do as much damage. You know, you even see this in shmups, like with Toho and stuff, homing weapons, they have that trade-off. You're always hitting things, so you can move around the screen freely, but you're not doing as much DPS. Fine, it works great in the other Contra games, but in a game where you're going through like a platformer and you're slowly spawning enemies on screen, uh, homing weapons are way too powerful, way too good, and they create this OP strat that you can use through this entire game which is you just slowly step forward, hold homing, slowly step forward, hold homing. This works through the entire game, all the way through to the very end. Not only does it work, but it is like the predominant strategy for how you get through this game safely. And I know some people are gonna say, well, I don't like to play that way. What I like to do is I like to like speed run through the game. This is how I play Contra and I think this is how Contra should be played. And it's clearly how the developers thought people are gonna play the game. They didn't check for this type of strategy. They didn't check for survival strategies. Instead, they, again, fan perspective, they just looked at how people play Contra, which is they just speed run through it. And they think, let's just design the game around that concept. You can also see this in the challenge sections. There's speed running sections in the challenge sections. And you can see that there's an actual speed running mode. I didn't unlock, we'll talk about the unlocks later, but there's a speed running mode. So clearly developers were thinking among these lines of like, let's make this game for speed runners. But they forgot, wait, no. <laughs> speed running is just a niche side hobby that some people engage in, but you can't balance your game around this concept. Because if I don't care about speed running, which I don't, I can breeze through your game without basically any punishment by just hanging back and spamming homing weapons. And even if they remove the homing missile, you can do this with a lot of the weapons. You can do this with the spread shot. You can do this basically every weapon. You just hang back, shoot things, slowly inching forward in the screen. There's no timer to punish you. That's another thing Metal Slug does to prevent you from doing this. You have to move. And even with the older Contra games, I went back and kind of tested this to see, okay, how did Contra do with this? Mostly dealt with it by just introducing locked in screens and boss fights, but even with something like Shattered Soldier, it has a few sort of scrolling screens where you can kind of step in them. But Shattered Soldier did something really simple but effective, which is that a lot of the enemies don't become vulnerable until they get further into the screen. So even though you can see the edge of the enemy and even though they're firing at you, they actually don't become vulnerable until they get a good deal into the screen. Funnily enough, this is how uh, shmups and auto-scrollers deal with this issue as well. They have that invulnerability phase as they appear on screen. This is fundamental to this game's style design, but did WayForward pay attention to this? No, no they did not. 
And I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, Mark is making a mountain out of a molehill here. Who cares if you can slowly step your way through the entire game? If I don't choose to play that way, it's not gonna be a problem for me. The issue though, is even if you decide, okay, you're not going to take your time and slowly step through the most of the game, the problem is that this oversight compounds and compounds into the way the rest of the game is designed because they approach the game with the idea that people are just gonna try to speed run through it. And so you can tell the levels are laid out to kind of prevent you from doing that, to like challenge you from doing that. And the irony is, is that the overall design of the game, the overall way the game's levels are composed is always gonna push you back into this lame style of play. Even if you don't think about it, even if you don't want to do it, you will find yourself falling back, hitting things with homing, falling back, sniping things at a distance because you'd be stupid not to. If there's such an obvious glaring weakness in the difficulty balance of the game, even if you don't think about it, you will start to naturally take advantage of it. And so it creates this very, very low stakes style of level design where you're never really in that much danger. Here and there, there's gonna be a few sections where you need to memorize a little bit, like, oh, this is gonna happen here, this is gonna happen there. The Aztec stage, there's a little bit of memo in that. The later stages, there's a little bit of memo in those, but for the good 70% of the game, just hang back, spam homing. If you don't have homing, spam some of the other weapons, and then you can use the perk system to make sure you don't lose your homing or lose homing damage. And if you want to be challenged by this game, even from the very outset, you need to kind of decide to play that way. You need to decide, I'm gonna run full speed through the game, headlong into danger, that's how I'm gonna play it. If that's how you're gonna play it, okay, but then you're gonna run into some other issues as well. The game doesn't even accommodate that style of play. Because first of all, this is not the most fluid, mechanical, sort of a speed techy type of game. Even though the developers obviously wanted to make it that way, they added in air dashes, they added in double jumps. You tell they sat down and they played a lot of popular speedrunning platformers and they're like, hmm, what if we did that with Contra? <laughs> you know, it really comes across that way. But the problem is, is that Contra is not built for that style of thing. And so even if you want to play that way, you're gonna have these big glaring problems. Like first of all, the auto-scrolling stage. So we've established this game is not doing a good job with difficulty balance for arcade players, for seasoned players. If you've played Metal Slug and 1cc'd it and you know how to play running guns, this game is going to be baby cakes. I was playing on hard mode, by the way. I'm playing on hard mode right away. I didn't even bother with normal mode. Still was not much of a problem. The thing about the older Contra games that I want to emphasize is that they too are not immune to some of these flaws. They too are exploitable to stepping techniques and kind of being able to spam weapons more than you should. But the virtues of the older Contra games is they're kind of like Konami's Mega Man, where are they the epitome of difficulty? No. But what they are is like a really fun, nice variety of gameplay experiences and mechanics that just flow so nicely and smoothly. You're just going from section to section. You got your unique challenge here and there. You perfect these little slices of gameplay. And it's like this little mega mix of different styles of gameplay, of shooting games all mixing together. And the thing about it with the earlier games is that they were made by Konami, a developer extremely experienced in the shooter genre in all kinds of different forms. They made shmups, of course, Gradius, one of the most groundbreaking important shmup franchises, and they know how to make an auto-scroller. They know how to make a side-scrolling shooter. They know how to do all these different genres and blend them together in a fun overall package, which is Contra. It's like a greatest hits of Konami shmup design. But with Way Forward, they clearly do not know what they're doing with all these different aspects of the gameplay. All they're doing is homaging earlier stuff in Contra games without understanding how to make it good. Case in point, the side-scrolling bike sections of this game are torture. As much as I criticize being able to rocket spam your way through the side-scrolling sections, and as much as I criticize them for being really underdeveloped and fan fiction-y and too easy, frankly, they are nothing compared to these side-scrolling levels. 
The thing about the side-scrolling levels is not only are they painfully easy, not only are they easily exploited, but they just go on and on and on and on with the most redundant, boring boss fights ever. And you could say, oh, well, they took this boss from that game. They took this boss from that game. Yeah, maybe they did, but they didn't make your player able to obliterate everything without ever trying. They didn't bring in the limitations of the earlier games. They gave you these weak, limited bosses, but your character is like OP busted as hell, especially if you know about the weapon swapping glitch, which I will describe now. So up to this point, I've clarified that because of the aspect ratio being way too wide without any locked in screens, and because you've got all these OP weapons, homing missiles and everything like that, the levels themselves are a breeze. They're a walk in the park. They're not that difficult. So then that leaves the boss fights of the game for challenge, especially Shattered Soldier. Uh, Shattered Soldier, I think, is probably the best Contra game, though that's a topic for another video. The series really leaned into its strengths with its mechanics and boss design. And so the boss fights of a Contra game are absolutely key. And when you first play the bosses in the game, it feels like you're not too bad. You know, they, you can tell they did a lot more work and effort into the boss fights than they did the stages. And the boss fights turned out better, for the most part, than the stages. Except that either the developers thought it would be cute, or the developers really didn't consider the weapon swapping glitch, which was in previous Contra games. Which is that if you get under the boss with the grenade launcher and any other weapon, and you just swap between them as you fire really fast, you can override the shot limit on their grenades and just spam the shit out of the grenades on the bosses for massive damage. And not only do you do massive damage with the grenades, but they also absorb enemy projectiles. And so the boss fights in this game are laughably easy. Once you understand this, you just get the boss where you need to get them. You just boom, 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 boom. You need to memorize them a little bit here and there, but it's a it's a walk in the park. You can blast through the game's boss fights with very little resistance. And that's a shame because you can tell the boss fights were the strongest aspect of this game's design. And I could see you really coming up with some boss fight stuff where if you just make yourself shoot them with a machine gun the entire time, there could be something there. But for a $40 game, for a game this expensive with a such high watermark for the franchise, that is not the metric that you can be judging a game by. You know, you shouldn't have the player actively choosing to rebalance your game for you as a developer. That is a failure on the game design part. And that's something that kind of annoys me whenever you criticize weapon balance, enemy balance, level balance, is you'll always have this sort of player perspective of, well, if you just choose to play underpowered, if you choose to play suboptimally, then the game's challenging. Sure, but then you're just making up your own meta challenge and you're leaving the development in the player's hand rather than in the developer's hand, which I think is a failure on the game designer's part. And so the level design with the unscaled aspect ratio, the lack of lock-in screens, the lack of enemies attacking you from behind, pushing you forward aggressively, the lack of a timer, forcing you to move forward, and then overpowered weapons that let you snipe things from across the screen all blend together to a very bland, boring, predictable gameplay experience. And that is the worst thing I think you can be if you're a run and gun arcade style game where it's not unfair. You're not going to be pounding on your tables and screaming in frustration, way forward, why, why? I kind of wish it was like that, even if it was like unbalanced and broken in some kind of Kusa way, but it isn't. It's not unbalanced in the difficult sense. It's unbalanced in that it's too easy, but it's not unbalanced. It's not broken. It's not frustrating, but it's boring. It's bland. It's designed by committee. You look at the credits for this game. It must have been, let's take no creative risks. Let's make a game that nobody is going to care about in the long run. If this was a game that was released by a smaller studio for $10, $15, I could say it's not super well made. It looks like hell, but you know, it's got some fun flavor here and there. Have mercy on the poor thing. Give it a try and kind of see that they're trying to do something cool. But the fact that this is a full on 
$40 release with partnership between Konami and WayForward. I mean, it's something went wrong. Something went terribly wrong. That's all I can say. I, I do not recommend the game. Maybe if it goes on sale for 15, 10 bucks. That's a damn shame. And then there's a scoring system, supposedly. When you go through and play arcade mode, you get scores at the end, and then the scores translate into points to unlock things in the shop, which I don't think is a terrible idea, except for the fact that the game does not communicate to you in any way possible how score is accumulated. I've heard about being arbitrary and kind of abstract in your scoring system, but this is new, that these newer games are deciding, let's just hide the scoring system. There's no score display as you're playing. There's no indication what's getting you score. You just have to get to the end of stage and just guess. Uh, there's time. Is it just how fast you go? Is it how many things you kill? You know, you look at the scoring ranking system of Shattered Soldier, the game you should be playing. Does it have the most sophisticated scoring system in the world? No, but at least it tells you, hey, this is your hit completion rate. And then at the end, it gives you your ranking and it shows what breaks down into the ranking. This game, you have no idea how well you did, how well you came by them. And then there is no leaderboard for the score system either. The only purpose of the scoring system in this game is to unlock things, which is a huge oversight. And I know that Contra doesn't have legit scoring other than Shattered Soldier having some ranks and stuff. But I mean, this is a huge missed opportunity. You could have put in a leaderboard and got at least some replay value there, especially because you really want people to speed run and everything. Might as well make like a speed running leaderboard to at least give it a little bit more credibility than uh, just throwing in some unlockable speed running mode at the end that takes an insane amount of credits to unlock. This is the last thing I want to complain about where I get it where you want me to play the game four different times to unlock all the characters and to unlock the bonus characters and everything which was a grind, but okay, I went ahead and did it and unlocked some of these characters. It took forever. But then I went into the shop and saw the prices for the speedrunning mode and for the extreme difficulty. And normally with a review of an arcade game, I absolutely would turn it up to extreme and try it out. But you know how much grinding it takes to unlock extreme mode with this amount of points? I already went through and played the game four or five times all the way through to unlock what I've unlocked to this point. I'm like, I'm not gonna play the game five more times to unlock extreme mode. Why are they making you grind this much for the highest difficulty mode and the speed running mode, like core content for the game? It's like, hey, do you wanna play the game over and over in some kind of higher stake setting? Well, play the game a bunch of times on hard mode to unlock them. Developers, please stop putting core modes behind long grinding sessions, especially for an arcade style game. Imagine this with a shmup. In order to play ultra mode in Mushimi Sama, you need to clear maniac mode 10 times. It's silly, it's stupid. I've looked online, I've seen, okay, does anyone even have footage of extreme mode so I can at least reference it in the review? Up to this point, nobody's even bothered unlocking extreme mode. Even Iconoclast, his runs, which are usually on the highest difficulty, he played on hard mode as well. He didn't want to sit down and grind for extreme mode either. No one does, apparently. So just another confusing decision among many. I do not recommend this game. If you want some delicious 3D style Contra action, it exists. Go play some Contra Shattered Soldier. And if you want a speedrunny action platformer modern take on Contra, that also exists. It's called Hardcore Uprising made by Arc System Works. A lot of people don't know about that game. That game is way cooler looking than this game and probably plays a lot better as well. I haven't played it, but I've heard great recommendations for it. So so anyway, if you know what the hell happened with this game's development and you're not under any kind of NDA, please let me know in the comment section. I would honestly be fascinated. That is the big question. How does a game with this much money and this many people working on it turn out so <laughs> How? Konami, I know you've been struggling, but this is a rough one. So anyway, if you enjoyed this review, please like, comment, and subscribe. I dropped 40 bucks on this game and I'm not getting that back. So uh, yeah, I'd appreciate you anyone tuning in and sharing the review if you can. Adios everyone.
So thank you to the $5 patrons, 100, 100, Accepting Panda, Admiral Coconut, Anhold, Alexander Pfeiffer, Anthony A, Arcade Hell, Arrow Viper, Auto Named, Bean Pit, Bo, Ben, Beetle Dames, Bog Hog, Borgy22, Chase Palumbo, Chris Yusufovich, Chronic Burnout 3, Clara Cliff, Climby Coyote, Coast, Coconut Crab, Color Boy, Cook Sand 666, Cook Some Soup, Krusty Boy, Dust Audio, Dan Chi, Darren Griffin, Dave Hansen, David Crespo, Delta Tango 6, Dick Jones, Dingo, Disco Star Slayer, DJ420, Praise It, Dr. Boski, Elias Alonzo, Evan Seraphet, Fabra, FCK, F Deluxe, Friskin, Frames Per Human, Francisco, Full Set, Game Boy Guru, Peace Machine, GPM, Gustavo Sanchez, Hausu, Jake Ryan, Jacob Valenzuela, JLab, JBRPG, Jink Hans, John Kelly, John Longwalker, K, K Horse, K2, Contain, Praise the Boys, Last of Seven, Low Casting, Mieshpa, Blaze, Mars Bar, Matt O'Leary, Maz, Megadeth 859, Minung, Monroe, Nathaniel Davis, Neon Dagger Games, Oakley Googles, Ospi, Pedro Perez, Psycho Blizzard, Queen Charlene, Ralph Trujillo, Raul VP, Real Skeen, Ren Halt's Time, Retro Schmupper, Rory Starks, Rolf 015, Ryan Bartlett, Scanline City, Shazzy, Schmup Junkie, Sarah Pong, Spiders STG, Steady AI, Steve Fiction, Street Magic, Super Funk, Taze Ryu, The Boot Rex, The Dirty Screech, The N1, The Old Benzda, Toho Rizardi, Sugumo, 2YU, Twilight EX, Unicoi Roots, Ursula, Ushimushi, Vic Viper, Beautiful, Wabby Legs, Zachary Patton, and Zeal.